Good evening, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks for tuning in to tonight's Mocktails and Masterpieces. We've got a great program for you. Two very special guests are joining me. We've got Rob Dixon coming up uh, in a little bit, uh, and uh, we've got uh, the incredible Dan Tepper with me right now. We're going to be exploring uh, or revisiting, I should say, two movements uh, from James Aikman's Peacemakers, which was premiered in April 2016. Uh, these are two movements where the orchestra uh, actually had uh, had no performance uh, uh, or no con contribution whatsoever. Uh, this is just the work of Dan Tepper and and Rob Dixon here, and uh, it was really remarkable to see uh, their their contribution, their musical contribution in this powerful piece. So, uh, Dan, it's great to have you uh, with us on this broadcast tonight. Uh, I hope things have been going well for you uh, the past few months. Maybe you can tell us what you've been up to. Yeah, it's been a fascinating time. Uh, you know, as soon as the the quarantine hit, um, I think I think something happens to me, and, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate. Uh, when, when I feel very confined, I feel limited in my options. I immediately uh, just asking myself what I can do given those parameters, and and what's kind of like the maximum amount of of freedom that I can have within those parameters. And and the thing that came up for me immediately um, was to do um, was to move forward on this project I've been meaning to to do seriously for a while uh, that I call Bach Upside Down. And it's a project where I play uh, pieces by Bach and then I've written this uh, computer program that'll immediately take what I just played with the same phrasing and all that and, and perform a chromatic inversion of it, which is like turning it upside down uh, and play it back. And uh, with Bach, it just works unbelievably well. It like gives you this um, uh, very fresh uh, feeling for the pieces. And, and even though it's the same information, so I, I posted uh, the first half of the Goldberg variations that way, just one every day or one every couple of days. Um, and uh, and then what happened was uh, a presenter in Europe put together a virtual festival. And he was kind of serious about it. You know, they did their publicity properly. They had a really nice uh, roster of people that they invited. And, um, and they, he asked me to do a live stream for them. And I'd never done that before. Um, and, and I'm a very computer oriented person. Uh, I've, I've been programming since I was a kid and, uh, and I produced this project uh, a year ago called Natural Machines where I written all these computer programs that improvise with me in real time. Um, and um, so, so, so actually it was very natural, me to, natural for me to move in, into uh, live streaming even though I'd never done it before. And, and, and that's really been kind of my major focus ever since. I did a live stream of the Goldberg variations, variations uh, for the American Pianist Association uh, and for other presenters. And I've been doing my own um, live stream concerts uh, every Monday at two. And that's been an incredibly fascinating journey uh, developing this online audience and really connecting with them in real time. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a whole whole new world right now. Well, you mentioned that you actually have a, a, a broadcast tomorrow and you're joining us from Brooklyn, but you're not even in your own apartment right now. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So so I've been doing these um, free streams on Mondays at 2 p.m. Uh, just on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. But I, I immediately, well, shall we say like a month into the pandemic, I was thinking that we have to find a way to make this sustainable because this might last for a long time. So I've also been doing uh, ticketed live stream concerts. And those have been really amazing because people have been um, very um, solid in their support. Uh, this will be my, my fourth one that I produced myself. Uh, and that's tomorrow I'm doing the uh, program I call Inventions Reinventions, where I play the inventions by Bach. And then since he only wrote 15 inventions, but there are 24 possible keys, I improvise inventions for the missing nine keys. Um, and so, yeah, that's at, um, at 3 p.m. tomorrow. Um, actually, if anyone's interested, you can get tickets at dantepfer.com slash ticks, T-I-X. And, um, and right now, my piano is being tuned uh, for that <laughs> concert. because It's very important for Bach that your piano be in absolutely immaculate tune. Uh, and so I'm at my neighbor's apartment right now, which is, has been empty during the whole pandemic. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I, I want to talk to you about um, natural machines. I mean, first of all, Dan, anytime that I read your biography again, I mean, I get low self-esteem. It's, it's hard oh, not. On. I mean, you're a trained astrophysicist. You no. touch <laughs> computer programming. You're playing Bach. You're, you know, this incredible jazz pianist. 
Um, but you came up with something really very, very beautiful. I mean, on top of all of the beauty that you created in your career, but natural machines. I mean, since we're going to be talking about the JFK movement, uh, which is piano solo, multimedia, filmic oratorio is what James calls peacemakers. Uh, so you're very experienced with multimedia and the presentation of art. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what natural machines is in case anybody wants to check it out on YouTube. Yeah, well, I do want to correct the record. I'm definitely neither great nor an astrophysicist. I, I have a bachelor's in astrophysics. That's all. <laughs> only a bachelor's. I'm sure only a bachelor's. All right. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I, I thought the multimedia element of of, of this piece uh, was was so inspiring. I, I remember being really awed by by the video work. Uh, it was beautifully done. And um, and indeed, as you point out, uh, I have a project, Natural Machines. That's also multimedia. It's it's multimedia in a different in a different way because, um, you know, I I would say that my my the core of who I am as a musician is as an improviser. Improvisation is really essential uh, to me in, in what I do in music, but honestly, also in life, it's just kind of who I am as a person. I, I'm a I just naturally kind of a spontaneous person, and I enjoy bringing that to the music. And so, for Natural Machines, um, everything is real time. There's nothing. Uh, pre-recorded or pre-planned. The only thing that's pre-planned is the way that things work. So it's like, instead of writing pieces, I write these algorithms that determine the rules and the kind of approach that the computer's gonna take and re uh, process pieces, you could call them. Um, and indeed, um, there's, an, there's a musical element where the computer uh, responds in real, real time to what I improvise at the piano but there's also a visual element where uh, I've written these programs that create a real-time visualization of the music uh, as it's happening. Um, but I think in both cases, um, there's, a, um, there's a willingness to bring together the senses. You know, I, I think it, there, there's, there's a danger that can happen with multimedia uh, pieces where the visuals, where, where the music kind of takes a back seat to the visuals uh, it can start to feel uh, a bit like um, like film music or something that you don't really pay attention to, and your your attention is taken up by the visuals, and and that's one very important thing for me in Natural Machines is that what you see on screen is a direct representation of the music, and so I think, I, and and people have told me that that this is the case. I think it really reinforces the experience of the music rather than than distracting from it. And I remember having a similar experience with JFK. I mean, with with uh, with the Peacemakers. Even though it's it's obviously a very different approach, uh, the the integration of the music and the um, the visuals seemed seemed really successful to me. I agree with that sentiment completely, and I encourage anybody who is uh, just now coming to discover uh, Natural Machines to check out uh, you know the, the blogs uh, and the interviews that you've done on it. I think you describe it perfectly, and I agree. Having watched a lot of it here uh, recently. Um, it is just beautiful how it's integrated and it is again so natural not to you know run off the title itself but there's a, a real beauty in seeing this thing uh, evolve uh, you know as the as your composition and the pieces that you play uh, yeah I, I should probably mention it's it's called natural machines because the whole idea behind it is that the music that I love like just to take the obvious example the music of Bach is kind of equal parts uh, rules and 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 logical structure and heart and intuition it's, it's the, really the meeting of, of nature and of, of the mechanical the natural and the mechanical and and uh, i'm really glad that you uh felt the the naturalness of it because that's something i've worked hard to to to, to make present in this uh, mechanical environment it's really 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 beautiful uh, so we're we're here with dan tepfer and we're setting up now the jfk movement uh, from james aikman's peacemakers and this is such a unique movement because it's just you uh, performing in this. Uh, as we've discussed on the numerous broadcasts we've had, Peacemakers, this has been the most ambitious project the Chamber Orchestra has ever undertaken, just with the sheer amount of forces on stage. Again, the Indianapolis Children's Choir, Indianapolis Arts Chorale, a sitar player, piano, saxophone, mezzo-soprano. Uh, you know, there are so many collaborators involved in this project, but here's a movement with just you alone. Maybe you could set this movement up for us. Uh, maybe perhaps just uh, you know what what James wrote, or if there were elements of you know personal freedom, uh, improvisation embedded in there. Uh, it was just you on the stage. Tell us about the JFK movement. Uh, it's been a while, but but if I remember correctly, it's all fully written out, um, and it's written out in 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 um, in a distinctive style, uh, and and I think 
if I remember correctly, that movement is all written out, but there's a, a lot of liberty that, that can be taken with phrasing uh, because it's it's kind of out of time. And so that was where the improvisational and, and, and where, where the, the degrees of freedom uh, resided was was in this the pacing of it. Um, and um, but there was a there was another movement right that I did with Rob, and, and that one was 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 very improvisational. So so I think if I remember correctly, this this one was fully written out. One thing I might share is that um, I remember that uh, yeah, this is the solo movement. I remember that that I forget if it was at the performance performance or at one of the rehearsals, but uh, suddenly a, a draft came in. And um, it was like a serious draft that would not die down. Um, and my music, uh, which is just, you know, a bunch of pieces of paper taped together on, on, the, on the music stand, kept actually like slowly falling towards me. And so here I am playing this, this piece that has a lot of uh, intervallic shifts, like your hands are kind of having to move around a lot. And I have to reach <laughs> to, to push the music back up. And it got so bad that the... Um, that the uh, I, I, it's, uh, the, the, the stage hand or, or the, um, uh, forget who, what his position was, but, but this very kind, uh, man, uh, actually came on stage and pushed the music back up for me. One of the, uh, the hazards of, of live performance. <laughs> I see that a lot in outdoor concerts with orchestra, trumpet player who holds the music up with his foot while he's, yeah. you know, trying to play at yeah. the same time. Well, you, you expect never... that when you're outdoors, but you don't expect that in a concert hall. No, if it was during the concert, no one would have known. I certainly didn't notice, but we were talking about these things that, you know, from a performer's standpoint that happen in the concert that you just try to roll with and, and try to get through here. Dan, it's been great uh, visiting with you, and I just wish you all the continued success. You're doing brilliant, brilliant work, and I love seeing all of these creative ways that you combine, you know, your, your, your many-faceted skill set with music in such a beautiful and, and, and uh, artistic way. It really is great to see you. Uh, we're going to move now to the JFK movement of James Aikman's Peacemakers with Dan Tepper. Thank you so much. Robert, Robert Kennedy, Kennedy Jr. wrote, On November 23, 1963, my uncle, President John F. Kennedy, went to Dallas, intending to condemn the notion that peace is a sign of weakness. He meant to argue that the best way to demonstrate America's strength was not by using weapons and threats, but by being a nation that practices what it preaches about equal rights and social justice. From the President's own speech at Amherst, I look forward to an America which commands respect not only for its strength, but for its civilization as well. And I look forward to a world which will be safe for democracy and diversity. What kind of a peace do we seek? Not a Pax Americana, enforced on the world by American weapons of war. Not the peace of the grave or the security of the slave. I am talking about genuine peace, the kind of peace that makes life on earth worth living, the, the kind that enables men and nations to grow and to hope and build a better life for their children. Not merely peace for Americans, but peace for all men and women. Not merely peace in our time, but peace in all time. I realize the pursuit of peace is not as dramatic as the pursuit of war. And frequently the words of the pursuers fall on deaf ears, but we have no more urgent task. First examine our attitude towards peace itself. 
Too many of us think it is impossible. Too many think it is unreal. But that is a dangerous, defeatist belief. It leads to the conclusion that war is inevitable, that mankind is doomed, that we are gripped by forces we cannot control. We need not accept that view. Our problems are man-made. Therefore, they can be solved by man. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable. And we believe they can do it again. Let us focus on a more practical, more attainable peace, based not on a sudden revolution in human nature, but on a gradual evolution in human institutions, on a series of concrete actions and effective agreements, which are in the interests of all concerned. There is no single simple key to this peace, no grand or magic formula to be adopted by one or two powers, Genuine peace must be the product of many nations. The sum of many acts. It must be dynamic, not static. Changing to meet the challenge of each new generation. For peace is a process, a way of solving problems. With such a peace, there will still be quarrels and conflicting interests, as there are within families and nations. World peace, like community peace, does not require that each man love his neighbor. It requires only that they live together in mutual tolerance, submitting their disputes to a just and peaceful settlement. And history teaches us that enmities between nations as between individuals, do not last forever, however fixed our likes and dislikes may seem. The tide of time and events will often bring surprising changes in the relations between nations and neighbors. So let us persevere. Peace need not be impractical, and war need not be inevitable. By defining our goal more clearly, by making it seem more manageable and less remote, we can help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly towards it. I'm joined now by a dear friend of the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra, Chamber Orchestra, Rob Dixon. Rob, great to see you here virtually. How have you been? Oh, great. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm I'm doing pretty well, considering you know 
that uh, we're all, you know, in this weird pandemic. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. I, I appreciate that you're, you took the time to join us tonight. I was really happy to hear that you've actually been playing. You know, there's something that all of us musicians are, you know, talking to each other about, about, you know, how we're going to get back uh, in front of audiences live and, you know, some outdoor uh, curbside concerts that very small uh, groups of musicians are putting together. But, you know, you, you're traveling. You always travel, you know, in, in your, your career. But now you're actually you're, you're playing, which is kind of heartening to hear. Yes, uh, I've been probably playing for about a month now where uh, places, you know, in uh, Ohio or like Cincinnati and Columbus and, and um, a little bit in Kentucky, but in some rural areas in Indiana since about the beginning of uh, of July, but you really kind of get a really good feel of where people are politically and <laughs> if they're open or not, or if they're closed or uh, what sensibilities they're taking uh, towards dealing with this, the pandemic. But, um, you know, uh, uh, if there's a gig someplace, I'll go to it. You know, I love music that much, so. <laughs> Well, that's, that's very obvious. I mean, what have you been doing, uh, you know, these months here and now? You, you, you always, um, you know, you're so knowledgeable, not only about, you know, your art form and performing and you're passionate about that, but you're so knowledgeable about the business side of, of, of music as well. We were chatting, you know, off camera here, uh, you know, the work that you've done for years with the Jazz Foundation and Indie Jazz Fest, you know, uh, writing grants, for example, uh, and, and being an advocate for, for your music and for the collaborations that you have so much of a part of here, not only in Indianapolis, but regionally and nationally. You know, what have you been up to the last uh, couple months here when you can't be in front of a live audience that, you know, might, uh, you know, project itself into the future here? Um, yeah, I think you know, uh, for the last few months, been kind of working for the Jazz Foundation, um, trying to plan for Indie Jazz Fest. I work as artistic director and um, you know, we've come up, we've done, um, a virtual, what we call block party, where we've had seven bands perform, uh, and WFYI came out and filmed it. We, um, organized the musicians, uh, relief fund. And that was interesting. And, uh, you know, and I know off, off camera, we talked about how, how you get involved in the, the administrative side when, when you do music. And it's like, I think I really got interested when I first was in New York, I moved to New York in uh, 90, like 97, 90, late 96, early 97. And I went out on the road with Illinois Jaquette. And my first tour was Europe. But I was really fascinated by the promoter that brought us over there because her business, to, to the way she was organizing, the festivals that we played, to the radio broadcasts, to just to all, all the uh, elements and the, uh, you know, the details that went into you know, uh, administrating a music organization or a music performance. So um, I think that's what really got me interested in being uh, on that side of the business as well. So it's it's actually, and then, you know, from there, I've just, like I said, I've just learned like school of hard knocks and trying things and not working or applying for a grant and completely messing up and then like learning from that. So, um, yeah, so, uh, much, you know, and then things that we have to do when we have positions like artistic director or a conductor, you know, the politics you have to do uh, the other, on the other side of music, you know, so becoming um, better at that. <laughs> there are professional grant writers, but, you know, it's very hard for somebody to step in and write passionately about, you know, a commission they're trying to, uh, right. you know, that they're trying to support. And I think that when you come from the position of really believing in what you do and the merit of it, why it should be funded, I mean, I think that does resonate with people. So it's great that we have advocates for for the arts like you who are so knowledgeable, but then can stand out on stage, you know, and then just deliver, you know, an incredible performance. I think that it's great that you're versed in all of this. You know, we, we were talking about uh, a project that we're, we're hopeful for here. Maybe you can talk about that. It was really very interesting when we sat down for lunch right before the pandemic hit. And I think this is a a really fabulous idea that I would love to see uh, work itself out, hopefully in the near future. Yes. So um, it's a project um, that I, you know, we talked about doing uh, a while back, maybe six months ago. Um, um, there's a great hip hop band in town called Native Sun and um, their music, they sample a lot of orchestral instruments playing. And I thought it would be, 
you know, with my relationship with the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra, I said, wouldn't it be great to marry these two things with the Chamber Orchestra with this this hip hop ensemble? And then we, we uh, uh, yeah, as you know, we plan to do something in the, fu- the near future and then the sky fell and, you know, COVID-19 happened and everything else got shut down for a while. But since then, um, we're gonna, in, Indianapolis Jazz Foundation is putting together three commissions um, commission works, um, and we, we may possibly do it virtually, and, and maybe a hybrid of the two. Um, if it, if it comes to September, where things are better, but if not, we'll do it virtually. And one of the things that uh, bands is that are that is doing the commission is uh, Native Son, and it's going to entail the hopefully. Um, and we're planning to have the ICO members of the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra join us um, for that performance. Um, so we're in planning, writing arrangements and uh, trying to figure things out and figuring out grant money for it and the whole nine. And it's and it's actually something that is brilliant. I think uh, it addresses like a black, the Black Lives Matter movement of, uh, you know, um, that, that has been has taken a resurgence since um, all the activities and the the, the the death of George Floyd um, and Native Son is calling the, the work legalized being black. So I think it is um, it is a it's a, they have a strong message It's very powerful and um, very much needed. I think it, um, something that is that is going to be a great piece of art to, to uh, to uh, reflect upon uh, what's happening in our time right now. And I, you know, it's particularly interested when we're talking about these arrangements and you're gonna have a huge part in making these arrangements too. So I have no doubt in my mind that, you know, the musicians of the ICO will have, you know, plenty to contribute to this, this, this project. And I look forward to working with you as this continues to evolve. So tonight we're gonna talk about your role uh, in Peacemakers, uh, which was really fascinating because you played, uh, you know, the, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. movement uh, uh, with with Dan Tepper, who we just had on. But right. then you also came out uh, during the Nelson Mandela choral finale. And I believe that was just, I mean, now you were, which is so natural for you, just completely imp- improvising on top of this, uh, everything that was notated for the orchestra and chorus that we had. And it was such an incredible contribution uh, on top of what James had already written. And, and it's one of the most touching moments for me uh, in, in this, uh, in the piece was that Nelson Mandela movement. I thought it was just so powerful, but your, your, um, your role here, uh, as a featured soloist with Dan Temper and, and MLK, maybe you can set this uh, segment up for us if you don't mind. Okay. Um, yeah, sure. So, um, the MLK suite was, uh, I, I was so excited to play and, um, I actually had, um, the privilege and, um, uh, to actually discuss and perform with James Aikman before I actually got to perform a piece with Dan, Dan Tepfer. So I was actually, he had, gave me a lot of insight into what, what the concept was. And, you know, of course I understood it was, uh, you know, about MLK. Um, and it was actually through, through it was uh, through Compose, so everything was written out. But, but um, he said, I want you to take liberties. He gave me sections of the piece. Like, Improvise here, improvise here, like whole big sections that he had worked and written all this beautiful music. He's like, you just play whatever you want on this section. I was like, are you sure? Because uh, <laughs> he wrote all this stuff, so you sure you want to play? But he said, yeah. He goes, I want you to do your thing. And I thought it was, um, you know, that was really uh, something that was, I thought it was great of him to do because to, to allow to this piece to, incorporate a lot of jazz elements and you know jazz being rooted in the black community and not only being a, a, a foremost American contribution to the world culture but also you know a music that kind of reflects the expression of socially unjust experiences of black uh, men and women women in America so I thought it was just fitting that he says well let me add these elements of jazz to this this classical work um, and it was it really came out something that was was uh, was great. Uh, I thought it was you know it it, it added a, another and enhanced the piece. I thought, um, and I'm not saying that because I thought I played great improvising because I don't know on the performance I don't know and the sound check I I think uh, actually 
my, my performance is a little bit better than it was in the actual performance. Matter of fact, it was funny because I don't think that, I think everybody thought it was just written out. So on the sound check, I think there was a section where I was playing like a 16 bars worth of 30 second notes. And then one of the second violinists is like, man, you're a master reader. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'll do what I can. <laughs> the performance was brilliant, Rob. I'm looking forward uh, to reading it now. Um, you know, if you have any questions for, for Rob Dixon, please send them uh, through our feed uh, and we'll come back with Rob to wrap this up. But here's the MLK movement, Rob Dixon, Dan Tepper. Uh, you're going to love it. Martin Luther King Jr., on the occasion of being the youngest recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, said, Sooner or later, all the people of the world will have to discover a way to live together in peace and thereby transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. If this is to be achieved, man must evolve for all human conflict a method which rejects revenge, aggression, and retaliation. The foundation of such a method is love. Some time ago, my brother and I were driving one evening. He was driving the car, and for some reason the drivers were very discourteous that night. They didn't dim their lights. Hardly any driver that passed by dimmed his lights. Very vividly, my brother A.D. looked over and in a tone of anger said, I know what I'm going to do. The next car that comes along here and refuses to dim the lights, I'm going to fail to dim mine and pour them on in all of their power. Somebody must have sense enough to dim the lights. And that is the trouble, isn't it? Force, hate begets hate, toughness begets toughness, and it is all a descending spiral, ultimately ending in destruction for all and everybody. Somebody must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate and the chain of evil in the universe. And you do that. I love.
Rob, it was great to revisit this this really powerful piece with you tonight. Some great comments here on our on our thread. Beautiful soprano tone, wonderful composition, uh, beautiful melodic line. It is always such a pleasure to to work with you and collaborate with you. I look forward to future collaborations between you uh, and the Indianapolis Chamber Orchestra. I wish you all uh, the very best here, and I hope we can sit down for coffee soon and catch up. But uh, thanks for joining us uh, tonight, Rob. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks, Matthew. Thanks for having me. I, you guys at the ICO are doing great things. I can't wait for our next collaboration. We appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Thank you.